and welcome to the Sioux Online on TV host debate of the mayoral candidates. I'm Heidi Ivany and today we are fortunate to have all five candidates. We have Robert Peace, we have Donna Hillsinger, we have Matthew Shoemaker, Ozzy Grandinetti, and Tobin Kern. Having said that, we will go right into the first question. Question number one. Given the current price tag on the downtown plaza project, to what would you have directed those same funds? We will start with Robert Peace. Well, thank you for the opportunity for that. Um, this question comes up a lot, uh, certainly online and at the door, and I think it's in some ways a question that looks to the past. Um, this project was already approved by the previous council. Whether it was uh, managed properly, whether the amount of dollars was, uh, um, you know, got out of hand, whether the communication of the project, uh, I certainly think, was really very poorly handled. People still believe it's a plaza and not a square and a place where people are going to come um, to uh, congregate in the downtown to skate and recreate. So I think um, it really does no good to go back and pretend that I was on council at that time, pretend that I was going to make those decisions. So I think with it already over halfway in the ground and moving ahead, I think the challenge now is to make sure it's a success and to make sure that people do use it. One of the things I have heard at the doors and I actually heard at a school last week where I was speaking were that um, there are newcomers to this city that don't have camps, that don't have boats and ATVs and all those expensive type things. And they need a place to come and recreate inexpensively or even free. And I think we, think we saw that this summer with Rotary Fest, with the Canada Day celebrations. The downtown was packed even before the Greyhounds game. People who couldn't even afford tickets to the Greyhounds game still came out for the live music and the free music. So there is an appetite for it. People just have to come down and discover the wonderful downtown. Excellent. Thank you. We will move on to candidate Donna Hilsinger. I, um, I get asked this question a lot. I imagine that we all do. And um, I, I stand fully uh, in support of the decision that I made uh, to make this investment into this downtown amenity. Um, it, you know, things aren't working the best that they could be in the downtown right now. We know there's a lack of vibrancy. We know there's a lack of, of, uh, uh, of activities that are going on on a regular basis. So when uh, do, trying to do the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result, well, that's just not going to get us anywhere. So we chose, I firmly supported uh, making this investment into this space um, that was recommended by an expert who, who uh, designs downtowns and creates downtown vibrancy and economic development and growth. Um, and this is going to be uh, a traffic generator for the downtown. We'll bring people uh, to the space. The mill market will bring people to the space. Um, it will be a place of recreation at little to no cost for our residents. Um, and, and it will um, uh, create vibrancy and bring others into other types of services, uh, restaurants, shopping, dining, et cetera. So um, I, I think it's a key game changer for us. And, and I fully support the investment that we're making. Thank you. Matthew Shoemaker. Thanks for having us first off and uh, for the opportunity to present our, uh, our thoughts and uh, opinions on these matters today. So I'm um, happy to be here. The downtown plaza had so much uh, of other projects money reallocated to it that I think that those things should have had council's attention. So for example, uh, in its most recent increase, uh, the majority of council supported reallocating money that would have otherwise went to fixing an area of the boardwalk that has been out of service for almost a decade, uh, the, the part that runs through the Bondar Maria, Marina. Sorry, uh, They voted to reallocate that money to the Plaza and Mill Market project. Uh, a, an excessive amount, I think $750,000 worth of gas tax money that should otherwise be allocated to roads went into the downtown plaza. So there are projects that we have on the books that could have used that money. Uh, personally, I think that uh, the hub, tra hub trail expansion is uh, a higher priority uh, than another plaza in the downtown. We've already got a plaza. 
uh, at the uh, at the Bondar tent, and if we wanted to invest in improving that, we could have done that at a lower cost than building an entirely new plaza one block away. So uh, the the money that was reallocated from the boardwalk uh, improvements, the money that was reallocated from roads improvements, and uh, that's where, if I were making the decision myself, I would have reallocated those funds, and where I think the council should uh, focus uh, on in the next term. Thank you very much. Ozzy? Thank you, and thank you for having us today. Um, I reiterate every comment that Councillor Schumacher has made. Um, like Robert Pisa said, um, we, we now have to live with it, and I guess we'll see what uh, what happens in the near future with uh, with the plaza, and if people actually do go to the plaza. Um, I think the, the money could have been better spent on possibly enhancing the, the, the current tent that we have downtown, um, enhancing our hub trail, expanding it to the west. Um, would I initially supported it uh, at the $6 million cost? No. Uh, that money could have been better off spent on possibly an affordable uh, apartment building in the downtown area. Uh, just like Sioux Michigan had uh, recently not done at about, uh, I think it was $12 to $14 million for that uh, uh, apartment building. Um, and they, they budgeted at $6 million and they go ahead and hand the contractor, and by all means, I'm not saying anything bad to the contractor, um, they're good to, good to the community, his family is uh, really good to the community, but they budgeted at $6 million and then they give him a $2.5 million gift, which I wouldn't have done. Ms. Hilsinger supported that. Um, that money could have been better spent on other things to enhance the downtown. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and last but not least, Chilvin Kern. All right, thanks Heidi. I just want to reiterate what other candidates said. I have no doubt that uh, my family will go down and enjoy the new amenities that uh, that will offer the city. It'll be great. That said, I, I can't help but suggest that uh, you know the previous city council was aware of the uh, other issues facing our community, the social problems like uh, homelessness and affordable housing and the ongoing uh, addictions epidemic, not to mention climate change. I mean, you see other cities mobilize in a much greater fashion to address climate change, which is the responsibility of all communities. Um, and you see great investment there. And, a lot, and the, one of the great things about investing in climate change infrastructure or, or infrastructure to address climate change is the citizens benefit, whether that means better transit or uh, better parks, better gardens, better use of uh, city assets, the city will benefit. So um, I see it as a miss missed opportunity where other cities were uh, busy getting to work. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, at this moment, we will open the floor for um, any rebuttals to the responses that have been made. I see an indication from Robert Peace. Yes, I think um, while Mr. Shoemaker speaks about uh, spending money better in other places, I think we have to recall that um, in his own platform, he's calling to waive development fees for developers, which are millions of dollars that are used to pave roads, build sewers, all those things that we have to do as a city. And if, if they are not paying it for it, then you are paying for it, citizens are paying for it. We also have projects out in the West End. Uh, there's a desire for a swimming pool. We haven't seen anything about that. There's actually a splash pad park out there that Mr. Shoemaker cut funding for and the people out there are quite upset because that's where the expansion of the city is happening. So I think when we talk about money uh, unwisely spent, uh, I think we have to also look at people's track records of where they've cut funding uh, for people as well. Okay. Thank you. Um, we will go to Ozzy Grandinetti. I just uh, thought of Councillor Hilsinger's comments on that there's little to no cost to the residents of Sault Ste. Marie. It's already costing us $8.5 million in counting. Plus, we still don't know the actual operating costs, what it's going to cost us to run this facility uh, for the year. Uh, just to heat it, your staff, I'm sure it's going to take uh, three or four staff members every day. I, I don't know, I haven't seen these numbers. So that's one thing that I would have to disagree with her on her comments. And then next to Matthew Shoemaker. Thank you. I just want to indicate that with respect to the West End splash pad, there isn't a splash pad out there yet, but there is one in development in the Bayview subdivision right next to the Manzo Pool. Uh, that uh, splash pad is 25% smaller than the uh, one at Bellevue Park. 
uh, but the budget was looking to be 125 or 150 percent of the cost of the one at Bellevue Park, which was only built a couple of years ago. So I supported having it at the same cost as the one at Bellevue Park, even though it's smaller. Uh, and uh, we did fundraising for the one at Bellevue Park. And if there's any shortfall in the one uh, at Bayview, I think that there's uh, the opportunity to do fundraising there. Or if the costs come in at uh, a higher amount uh, even thereafter, then uh, it's something that we'll have to consider as a council as a whole. Okay, thank you. To you, Donna. Um, uh, just to clarify, Mr. Grandinetti, on the point of when I said little to no cost, I meant for someone to use the facility, for someone to attend and use the skating uh, space and the splash pad space and so on. So I would ask that, that the public think about this question. You know, it's not working now the way it is. And downtowns need to be vibrant and they need to have economic activity for our city to grow to attract new people to come and live here, to be, uh, to be a great place for families, to uh, attract professionals like doctors uh, to come to Sault Ste. Marie. A, a vibrant downtown, a downtown that has a strong economy is really important. And we've seen a huge investment by the private sector in our downtown space over the last five years. And I think it's really important that the city said, this matters, this matters what you did, and we are gonna make our own investment to, uh, to create that vibrancy and, de and deliver that economic growth. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, and having said that then, we will move on to the next question. This question comes from a community member who did reach out, who identifies as a senior citizen, who has recognized a 1% increase in her pension, however, has also recognized a significant increase in her taxes. Um, so she wanted to know, how will you make City, city Hall more accountable for spending moving forward in view of community members who are struggling to stay afloat amidst rising inflation and taxes. We'll start with you again, Robert. Sure. Well, I think um, the dilemma we're facing here in Sault Ste. Marie is that we have an aging population, mm -hmm. uh, we have a shrinking population. And uh, while it's been exciting news to learn that there's been an increased enrollment in some schools, that uh, the overall population has decreased uh, in the last census. And that's very concerning because the problem with a decreasing population is that means you have a decreasing tax base. So what we hear at the door, and what I think we've all heard, is that most people would like better services, better infrastructure, and pay less taxes. And that, unfortunately, is just simply not possible. So, uh, and anybody who tells you that is, is selling a dream. So it's basic finances. You need the money to do the things that people want. Do we have to do everything? No, but we, you know, if the citizens speak up and want something, then we should listen to them and, and make sure it happens. So the only way we're gonna do that is to increase our population. And the only way to do that right now is to attract newcomers to open the floodgates for new Canadians coming here. But since everything's connected to everything else, you need housing for those people. You need employment actually is here. We have employers here that can't find housing for employees that they're bringing in. And the biggest thing we have to do, which I'd like to speak about later, is we have to retain people from leaving because my research assistant has done some interesting research at the high schools and the numbers are scary about how many people want to leave the Sioux when they graduate and never come back after university. So unless we deal with bringing more people and increasing our tax base, we will never be able to solve this problem. Okay, thank you. And over to Donald Hilsinger. So, you know, managing expenses, controlling, or, you know, attracting revenues and managing expenses is something I've been doing in, a, in our own business for the last 40 some odd years. Uh, we do it every day. Uh, it's important to our survival. And uh, it's important to our reinvestment um, in, in, what, in, in our business. Um, in my platform, I've discussed um, uh, capping taxes below the rate of inflation, tax increases, capping tax increases below the rate of inflation to a maximum of 2.5%. Um, I'm also discussing, uh, uh, or I believe, that we should be um, adopting a zero-based budgeting process um, at the city, which focuses on the council, uh, with feedback from our residents, obviously, but council's decision on strategic priorities, making investments in 
strategically what council has uh, with our staff in, in discussions, what's going to move us ahead, what's going to help us all together achieve all those goals. So we, we have to find the funds to make that possible. I think that different style of budgeting process can be very helpful in that. Um, and then there's, there's, there's other ideas there. I mean, it, it's certainly a challenge in these days of inflation and perhaps an impending recession. Uh, there's a lot to deal with on the financial side of things. So um, there's other um, uh, efficiencies uh, through the KPMG service report that came out a few years ago um, that we could be undertaking. I think that there's a lot that we can do if we put our, our minds to how we can grow revenues, how we can maintain expenses or, uh, and, uh, and find funds um, to, help, to help people like that senior who, uh, who's really having a, a tough time. I, it, it certainly is a challenge, but I'm up to it. Thanks for the question. Well, uh, it's, it's one of the most important ones that we get, and it's, it's one of the most important issues for the people who live here. And uh, over the last uh, two terms that I've been on council, I brought forward $3 million in savings proposals, two million, over $2 million of which have been accepted by city council. So I have a record on my website, matthewshoemaker.ca, of every single budget motion that I've brought and what the savings have been from that budget motion. So uh, if uh, those uh, uh, proposals had not been put forward, taxes would have been even higher than they had been in the past. Now in the past I have campaigned on uh, keeping taxes at or below the rate of inflation, but that's when inflation was hitting a benchmark of 2% a year. I, I think that that's an unrealistic uh, um, uh, pledge at this time because inflation is 8 or 9%. It would be wholly unacceptable for uh, our tax increases to be that high. Uh, I can commit uh, to, to that resident, to every resident, that there will not be an extra dollar in the budget uh, than what is necessary to get the jobs done. If we have to spread work out over a number of years, I think we should do that. If we have to implement things gradually, I think we should do that. This most recent council approved the downtown plaza uh, at the beginning of the term and then approved three or four cost increases in the plaza over the course of the term. So to um, have my friend say that uh, she wishes to control uh, the budget uh, is, is not in line with what her record shows. Uh, but I've got a record on cost savings that I think is uh, uh, substantial and there for anybody to check it out. Okay, thank you. Ozzy Grandinetti. Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, we have to watch uh, what we're spending and how we're spending our hard earned tax dollars. Uh, this is one question that I've been asked many times at the doors is the, the high cost of living in our homes on top of uh, our heating bills, um, the cost of groceries nowadays, at the, at the going up to the stores, everything else. Um, one thing we have to do is we, we have to separate our wants and our needs. Again, Back, we'll go back to the plaza because this is a big issue. Every day we hear, we hear this. Did we have to spend 8.5 million on a plaza? No. Um, personally, I don't care what this consultant says, what we have to do downtown. Um, this guy's out of town, we could have waited. Um, we're building things when, when materials are at an all time high. And I think we're gonna pay for it in, uh, in the future for this. Uh, now, to increase our, to, uh, to bring taxes down, I think we should have to increase our tax base bring in more business. Um, as far as I'm concerned, we've been stagnant uh, in, in the industrial sector, and we still don't know the effects of what's gonna happen when one of our main industries uh, goes to green, because we know it's gonna cause a significant loss of jobs. Thank you. Thank you. And Tobin Kern. Thank you. So what really concerns me is not what we spend today, but what we will spend. And I, I would have liked to have heard more about the unmitigated, basically unmitigated risks of uh, the addictions epidemic and, and uh, affordable housing and homelessness. homelessness. What will these cost in terms of in, uh, increases in demand for policing services and the cost of the social services board? What will this cost us? That's my concern. If we don't make these the, uh, the main focus and turn the tide on these issues. I'm very concerned about that. Um, one of the great things about climate change and, uh, is that it dovetails very nicely with um, reducing uh, spending. Now, every time you uh, engage in building, start a shovel, you're creating greenhouse gases. But if you really uh, are, are focused on, on precise building and only build uh, where necessary and uh, focus on refurbishment, you can both save money and uh, save on greenhouse gas emissions. 
Uh, I would like to see uh, significant investment in public transit. And basically, I think that it has the ability to increase ridership and uh, decrease the financial burden if we do improve services, but it also will save uh, um, community members money. It has the potential to do so. I know many families that pay more in car bills than housing bills. And if you could go down to uh, uh, a one car family while saving the environment, that's fantastic. I think we could also invest more in, uh, in urban agriculture and uh, it has the potential to provide fresh local food uh, to community members at a limited cost. Um, so th there's another opportunity for savings. Thanks. Thank you. So once again, we will open the floor to rebuttal. Robert Peace. Sure. Um, well, for this senior who's concerned about her taxes going up, um, I'm concerned about Mr. Shoemaker's proposal to spend 20, 30 million dollars maybe on a new police station. Is that something that's a priority when we have homelessness, when we have mental health and addiction issues, when we have people who can't afford rents in this city? Is that a priority? That sounds a lot bigger than a downtown plaza. And the other thing I haven't heard is, what will we be doing with the old police station? Is that going to become another hospital sitting like a ghost? Um, these are things that haven't been discussed. These are things that are being talked about, and I'm concerned about the kind of capital money that Mr. Shoemaker is talking about throwing around, and that's going to significantly affect people's tax dollars that they're going to have to invest in something like that at this point. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Donna? Sure. Um, I think I just want to remind my friend, <laughs> Mr. Shoemaker, that we, we, uh, we experienced a lot of challenges in the last few years um, during the pandemic with um, escalating prices due to supply chain issues and other things. And there were certainly other projects besides the plaza that came in at different costs than what were what were an originally budgeted or anticipated or forecast to be. So um, I, I think to say that that um, because I voted for something where costs were different at one period of time to another means I don't care about money. I think that that's, that's frankly um, not true. And we've all been in that position, uh, those of us who are councillors around the current table, in having to, uh, to deal with these things, wanting to put projects forward to move things ahead and dealing with uh, the challenges of, of today's economy and inflation. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Matthew Shoemaker. Thank you. With respect to um, the cost of uh, a new uh, police service station, our police station was built in 1969, and so it's approaching uh, 55 years old. Um, and it doesn't meet accessibility requirements. The hallways aren't uh, wide enough to fit uh, people in, with uh, mobility devices through them. Uh, the cells are not designed uh, to, uh, to, for people with mobility devices. So we're going to need to spend money on a police station. My position is if we are going to have to spend money on a police station, let's determine what the best location is for it as a community benefit and then implement a plan to get it there. My belief is that it should be in the downtown area, not only to increase the uh, perception of safety or the, the reality of safety for folks in the neighborhood, uh, but as well to bring administrative staff downtown so that they're out uh, in the community uh, after work or on lunch hour uh, and create a vibrancy in the downtown. And these are things that you pay for over time with a mortgage. Ozzy Grandinetti? Well, we, so we got up, so thank you. We got on top of the police station, uh, as I said before, I am not going to support uh, um, a new police uh, station. Um, first of all, I'm going to look at what it's going to cost to uh, renovate. Thank you. First, first of all, I'm going to I'm going to look at what it's going to cost uh, to renovate the building, opposed to building a new one. And uh, again, I've said this before: we have the best location in Sault Ste. Marie right now for that police station. Everything is moved to the north part of the city. I know we have our issues downtown right now. And I don't think building a police station downtown is going to solve the issues. Um, I do support um, a satellite police station in the downtown area, whether it be somewhere on Queen Street or uh, even City Hall. I'm sure uh, there's a few floors at City Hall or even one floor that we could accommodate a handful of police officers and administration staff. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Okay, we will then move on to the third question. How important 
is making the highway going east four lanes, and would you push for such infrastructure with the provincial government? We will start this time with Tobin Kern. Well, it does seem, you know, when you think about it plainly, it does seem like a good investment, but uh, I'm afraid that if, if you go elsewhere in Ontario, you see where that investments are being made in public transit and moving away from individual car use. So while that might be a good investment for a decade, maybe two, I don't think it's a sound investment in terms of the way we're going to be mo moving each ourselves in the future. So no, I would uh, advise them to invest in uh, transportation infrastructure that, uh, the province I mean, that actually works to mitigate the impacts of climate change. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Tobin. Yes, uh, I, w I would love to see a four-lane highway uh, east of the city. Um, would I have it in the, in the area that, that we have it now? No, I would have it uh, so that it runs. I actually seen a map year, about 10 or 12 years ago from an engineer, uh, just as uh, they were working on this one, is I would have it going away from the city. Uh, he showed me a map that was uh, taking you in the sixth line area, so it takes all the traffic away from the city because this way here it doesn't congest uh, our local roads. Um, Sudbury did it on the way to North Bay. Um, and but if it ever happens, I doubt it'll happen. They've been working on the one from uh, Toronto to Sudbury. It's been what 25, 30 years now, and they're still not finished. I believe they still have 80 kilometers to go in the French River area. Um, but if it does happen, I would like to see it. Thank, Thank you. you, Matthew Shoemaker. Yeah, I, I agree with Ozzy on this. Uh, there, there is in fact a four-lane highway going east from Trunk Road all the way to St. Joe's Island. But uh, from uh, the end of Second Line at the bottom of Black Road uh, around the city, the bypass, as, as people in town would know it as, uh, through the, to the northern end of, of town so that we can get traffic that's traveling through uh, the country off of our Black Road, uh, Trunk Road, uh, Great Northern Road uh, arteries. I think that that would be beneficial for our community because right now we are having to resurface our, our connecting links. We're having to resurface those more frequently because provincial traffic uh, is passing through our town, congesting our roads, and I think having an easier way for that traffic to get from the east uh, end of the city to the north end of the city uh, is something that uh, I'd be keen to, to discuss with the provincial government. Okay, thank you. Don Hilsinger. Heidi, could I get some clarification on that question relevant to, um, I th believe it was uh, four lane highway to the east to, can you just, could you read it again kindly? Um, it comes from a community member. Um, how important is making the highway east four lane and would you push for such infrastructure with the provincial government? Yes. So yes, I would do that. Um, and the primary reason I would do that is, is while it is important for us to continue to reduce our dependency on vehicles, we will always have vehicular traffic, including trucks, um, for transportation reasons, for moving our goods um, backwards, you know, not backwards, sorry, <laughs> for moving our goods to and from, if you will. Um, and, and the primary reason for wanting that four laning is really for safety. Um, you know, that's the key thing that four lanes is going to is going to get us. And the more that we're able to implement over time um, to make it safer to travel, whether that's for transport or or um, or commercial vehicles or, or folks traveling uh, to other parts of the province, um, I think it's I think it's a really important thing to be considered and to figure out how, how to get done. Thanks. Okay, thank you. And Robert Peace. Well, as far as highways and constructing new roads, uh, I guess there's a few things. One, <clears throat> uh, yes, no doubt we're still going to be transporting goods in and out of Sault Ste. Marie, whether that's commercial goods, industrial goods. Uh, hopefully there's more electrification. Hopefully there's more ability to develop a stronger rail system and not rely as much on highways to transport things. I think there's a lot of things that have to be looked through the green lens on this. There's another aspect of this, that's the whole indigenous aspect. Um, they need to be at the table and need to be at the table more seriously uh, in discussions about any kind of land uh, that's being used. And the whole discussion of bypassing a uh, city, this has been the bane of all businesses in small towns across this country and across North America, is this kind of mentality of let's bypass the city, take away this traffic. How would the businesses on Great Northern that benefit from this traffic flowing through feel about that? 
suddenly taking away that business. We've already done that to an extent with Great Northern, taking the traffic flow away from the downtown, which other cities have kept and allowed the downtowns to flourish. So we, we handicapped our downtown that way. We built this sort of uh, planning monstrosity on Great Northern, but it is now the hub of where a lot of commercial activity is. And if we're now going to bypass that yet again, um, so that we can send the thousands of people that are traveling across this country away from Sault Ste. Marie, I think that's a foolish exercise. Okay, thank you. We will open the floor now for rebuttal. Ozzy Grandinetti. Thank you. Um, as the Mr. Peace's comments is, the, the, what I say bypass, if we, like, and Councillor Shoemaker touched on this, is that we've spent tens of millions of dollars resurfacing a road, roads. We've widened uh, Black Road to four lanes, which could have stayed two lanes. Mm -hmm. Um, they've done, I believe, some resurfacing on uh, Black Road from second line to third line. So when I say bypass, it's, it's like anything else. We, try, we use the I-75. We, we go, if I'm going to stop somewhere, I'm going to take the off-ramp and stop and get fuel or have something to eat. I'm sure people will do the same thing if they're traveling from southern Ontario, going, going uh, west or vice versa. They'll stop in Sault Ste. Marie rather to, to refuel, stay at a hotel, spend the night at a hotel. Um, do some shopping, whatever they have to do. So it's it's not to, to bypass to keep take people away from Sault Ste. Uh, take people away from the city. It's more or less j j just to get the traffic flowing a little better. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Joe Kerr. Hi, I think what's not mentioned is um, I have a great concern that the tra traffic won't be flowing just because of the way that we'll be required to move ourselves. Um, you look at many ma major car manufacturing manufacturers and they're moving away from uh, gas vehicles. That said, there's a great expense uh, to electric vehicles, which will likely go down for a period, uh, but there's, there's bound to be a, a bottleneck when it comes to uh, the materials required to replace every vehicle with uh, an electric car. So if you look to other um, cities in, in uh, elsewhere in Ontario, you even see communities even making roads smaller or not investing roads in the same way because they see the writing on the wall. A lot of us will be moving around in uh, shared or public transportation rather than cars. So for me, if, I, if uh, the province was giving me a wish list, I'd say give us money to uh, uh, modernize transportation. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, next question. Uh, so it has been observed that some other northern communities, such as Sudbury and North Bay, are growing and expanding. In your opinion, what is it that they are doing that we are not? Tobin Kern. Wow, that's a great question. Um, I, uh, I think the, the reason why you see people move within Canada is likely for employment opportunities. So, uh, I. You know, um, could a community always use greater employment opportunity? And, and what I mean by that is uh, um, jobs that you can build a family around, not necessarily service in industry jobs, but uh, uh, jobs that have a wage that uh, a family can um, support themselves with. So absolutely, we need to increase uh, um, the number of jobs in our community. Uh, I think Sault Ste. Marie will grow. Um, uh, basically, I think we'll, in the coming decades, we will see uh, a big wave of immigration, uh, some, some positive and some, uh, and we'll also see an increase of uh, refugees, unfortunately. So the Sioux will get bigger and we should definitely plan for that. So uh, I, I know that's not a direct answer to that question, um, uh, but uh, we should plan to grow and our community will grow likely like all communities across Canada. So I'm not too concerned about uh, us not growing at, at a rate another community might might be. Thank you. Uh, the answer, um, Sudbury and North Bay are uh, pretty much uh, hev heavy in the mining sector. And uh, we know where mining's took off right now all over Northern Ontario in the world. Um, again, we need jobs. We need a lot of jobs. Um, <coughs> Councilor Shoemaker could correct me on this if I'm uh, wrong, but I think four years ago we've seen a study that Sault Ste. Marie is going to see a decrease in population within the next 10 years. And uh, su from Sudbury South, uh, they're basically going to see an increase in their population. Uh, and, and I, again, it's, it's all jobs. We need good paying jobs. We have to look at manufacturing jobs, uh, possibly something with the steel industry, um, more businesses like the flake board, 
SIS manufacturing. If, if we could get uh, four or five of those going in, in Sault Ste. Marie, I think it would be good. It'll, it'll bring, bring people, bring talent back to Sault Ste. Marie. And uh, even look at the, in the IT sector. Go south, uh, tap these kids that have moved away from Sault Ste. Marie that were from here, and maybe get them to start up some type of uh, IT companies in Sault Ste. Marie. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Matthew Shoemaker. Thank you. Uh, Ozzy is right that there is a report that states that the population will decline, but then uh, after that period of decline, the projections are that it'll turn around and pick up because we've got uh, a great number of people retiring who are living quite a long time, uh, thankfully, and we need to replace uh, the, the jobs that they are vacating. So for a, uh, a generation we'll have, and hopefully beyond, we'll have a, a a big chunk of retirees plus a big chunk of active work, active laborers who have replaced those retirees, which proje which projections show that our population will grow uh, over the course of the next uh, several years. So, uh, why we haven't grown at the rate of North Bay and Sudbury uh, is is unclear to me. We have as good, uh, if not better, uh, of a community than those place uh, those places. But like uh, Tobin and Ozzy have said, job opportunities uh, in our community need to be. Uh, available for people to move here. That's why I have harped on the provincial government about relocating OLG jobs to Sault Ste. Marie because in a place like Toronto where they've got about half of the OLG jobs uh, and a growing population, those uh, that workforce can get absorbed into the rest of Toronto's economy with no issue. But it would be a, a significant shot in the arm for our community uh, to benefit from those jobs and it has a, a much greater economic impact to have those jobs here in Sault Ste. Marie than it does to have them down south. Thank you. We are projecting to see uh, growth, as Matthew mentioned, um, and for the reasons that he mentioned. Um, but we already have seen um, growth if we look at the number of new families that have moved here in the last several years. And in particular, um, at counted as part of our population are our students. And, and both the college and the university have done yeoman's work um, in attracting uh, many, many new students uh, from, from all over the world and all over our province to come to Sault Ste. Marie to study and to and to make a good career for themselves. So, so we are going to continue to see that growth. They, are, they continue to work hard to do that. We will have a natural increase in population because of the retirements and the jobs that will become available to us. And our role as a city council is to provide that vision and that leadership that says, here's what we need to do to be ready. Here's how we have a vibrant community. Here's the investments that we need to make that are going to attract people to come and live in Sault Ste. Marie, where, where they can have a quality of life. Life. They can have a good lifestyle. They, they don't spend hours in traffic. Um, they have access to great public transportation. They have access to arts and culture and music lessons for their kids um, and great locally grown food. So that's our role right now is to prepare ourselves to, uh, to uh, receive um, and uh, you know, use our unique selling propositions um, to grow our population. And it is going to happen. Thank you. Robert Peace. Well, the reality is, is to grow our population, we need services, we need infrastructure, and we need the ability to attract people here. Uh, there's a lot of competition. Read, just read the mayoralty campaigns across uh, Ontario, across Canada, read elections in the U.S. They're all saying the exact same thing. We need, we need jobs, we need housing, we need, it's all the same. So we're in competition with a lot of people. And I can tell you that right now we're talking about, the, you know, wanting to have an increase in people. We need doctors, we need veterinarians, we need tradespeople. We need, the list goes on and on and on. So uh, we need to be an attractive place to live. Um, the other thing, we're, we're talking focused mainly on, on new people coming in. Uh, my wonderful grade 11 research assistant who's been helping me this election has gone out to the high schools and done a very interesting poll which has some very concerning news. And I don't think the city has done anything to go into the schools and try and convince kids that the Sault Ste. Marie is a place to stay. We've got numbers right now, grade 11, after university, will you remain in Sault Ste. Marie? Grade 11, 80%, 89%, sorry, no. Grade 12, 75%, no. 
Those are huge numbers. When you think that our kids here in Sault Ste. Marie do not want to stay after university, we better be getting into the schools early to talk about the kinds of jobs that are available here because I had a career fair a number of months ago and it was astonishing to see the number of people that came in and had no idea of some of the niche industries and those are the kind of ones that we're going to have to grow. Dreaming about the car factory or a brand new huge plant is probably something we can shoot for but not realistic. We have to encourage those small businesses to grow. Okay, thank you. At this time, the floor becomes open once again for rebuttal. Okay, moving on. I think we're all in agreement. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, so, the next question then has to do with the shortage of doctors and the ongoing discussions around that. Specialists in particular are needed. What is it that you will do to attract more physicians? Robert Peace. Well, I've had the pleasure to be working on a recruitment campaign right now for that very matter. And uh, one of the things you have to do is you have to, it's a long-term recruiting process because the chance of uh, recruiting a doctor who's already has a practice somewhere in Southern Ontario is almost nothing. Uh, maybe you might uh, attract someone who's in the last couple of years of their practice that like to do something on a small scale up here, but realistically, we need young people, young doctors that are going to stay here and live here, create a family here and be in business here for many years to come. So that uh, recruiting process is quite lengthy from when they, if they're from the Sioux, leaving the Sioux, tracking them to where they're going to med school and then making sure that they come back. So making sure that they come back is the trick. And if you've got this number of students that are saying they want to leave and not come back after university, what is it that we're going to do to make students come back? And that is going to have to be making an attractive city. Um, having something that doesn't have arts and culture, something that doesn't have sports, something that doesn't have things for families, uh, not having those kind of things, which are some of the faults that we have when we talked about North Bay and Sudbury, some of the things that we lack here that we haven't invested in in the past. We need to do that. And that's what's going to attract the doctors. It's going to be lifestyle. It's going to be uh, the ability to practice in smaller uh, community. Uh, I know already in the hospital, as far as the internship is concerned, that the hands-on ability to deal with doctors one-on-one -on -one is much greater. And to get those people who were born here or born in Northern Ontario to come back to a community that they love and a lifestyle that they love. And that's what we have to sell. Okay, thank you. Donna? Um, I've been chair of the Physician Recruitment Committee in Sault Ste. Marie, along with uh, some folks from the hospital and the group Health Centre and our CAO, um, and Algoma West Academy of Medicine, and I'm really familiar with the physician recruitment process. And our staff, uh, we have two staff that work as a liaison to NOSM, the Northern Ontario School of Medicine, um, uh, plus go to recruiting events and spend infinite amounts of time talking with people about locating their practice here in Sault Ste. Marie. And we, we we certainly have uh, uh, um, recruited somewhere between 15 and 20 doctors per year uh, for the last uh, number of years. Mind you, we've had doctors retire as well, so you know we don't get we don't get ahead from a net perspective um, uh, in all cases. Um, however, it's 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 having a community um, that supports the kind of practices that doctors want to have these days and who want to take on. Um, we have a unique opportunity with the Group Health Centre because it affords a different style of practice than can be had either in the hospital or in private practice. So this gives doctors a choice um, and, and our community, um, our values and our efforts need to align with the values um, and, and what doctors are looking for in terms of in terms of where they want to practice and the lifestyle that they want to have. So um, I would advocate for um, our community, our city. Uh, currently we, um, we uh, invest in that physician recruitment committee along with the Group Health Centre and the Sioux Area Hospital and I think we need to talk um, about a, 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 an updated physician recruitment strategy that's going to take us out the next five to ten years, number one, and I think we have to be prepared to put a little bit more money behind it that's going to help us achieve those goals. Thank you. Matthew Schumacher. 
Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with Donna on this one, absolutely. There's, the city contributes, I think it's about eighty or $100,000 a year to uh, the Physician Recruitment Committee and the hospital and group health centre similarly contribute. But we need to look at whether that's enough. As Donna mentioned, I mean, are we getting ahead? Uh, if it will take a little bit more money to actually help us uh, have a catch-up period or to, uh, or to get ahead of where we are, that's, that's absolutely, that investment is critical. One thing that hasn't been mentioned and I think everybody would agree with is physicians who come here, uh, their spouses also need um, um, uh, a place to work and their, and their children need a good, pla good places to go to school. So we've got great post-secondary institutions, we've got great elementary and high schools, but we need job availability for the spouses or partners of uh, physicians so that we can attract not only them to come and practice here, but them to have a, a well-established family here and uh, a family that's part of our community. Okay, thank you. Ozzy Grandinetti. I, uh, I agree with Councillor uh, Hilsinger and uh, Sh Shoemaker on this. Um, luckily, well, my, f my, uh, my own family doctor went on uh, maternity leave a few months ago and she had a hard time finding somebody to come up to replace her patient, patients. And, and luckily we, uh, we did get a, a nice young doctor that came up uh, to take over her practice for the year, year and a half that she's off. Um, and I'm going back to a, a physician that I did work for years ago. Um, both him and her were physicians out of the hospital and they both moved to southern Ontario. Actually they got uh, uh, trans, trans uh, they ended up going to southern Ontario uh, to another hospital and I asked them, I says, why are you leaving? You like it up here, you have a cottage, you have a beautiful home off of Bruce Street and basically he told me is the province pays us, they tell us where we have to work. So I don't think that municipalities should have to fight amongst each other to get doctors to come to their area. I, I think that they sh we should try to sell our city to these doctors and show them what we have and then make them, let them ha make the decision on coming here. Um, and then th this way here, um, we're not fighting amongst each community. Thank you. Thank you. And Jonathan Curry. Hi there, I just want to say thank you for the qu question. I know it is an important one. I know uh, when our family moved to Sault Ste. Marie, and my wife returned home, uh, it was a number of years before we had, a pr had primary care, so it is a, a problem that we don't have uh, enough doctors here. Um, I, I think uh, we need to continue the work in recruiting physicians, but maybe we could explore different avenues of how we go about recruiting. Um, I, I often wonder if we invested younger uh, in, in the way of uh, um, maybe f uh, forgivable loans to people who are in the, at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine or um, uh, have greater discussions with, with the school about uh, how the number of graduates who do graduate aren't necessarily coming to Northern communities and how we might go about uh, um, improving, improving that dynamic when they, when they're going about their selection process. So I think uh, we need to continue it, but maybe there's more dynamic ways that uh, money can, can be spent. Thanks. Okay, thank you. Once again, we'll open the floor to rebuttal. Robert Peace. I think there's um, an opportunity to uh, start to think of some real out of the box ideas. I think uh, the cost of bringing in doctors, as we know, on weekends and uh, the cost of having to fly people out for surgeries is so astronomical. I don't have the figure on the tip of my fingers, but you can imagine the cost of having to helicopter and fly people to different places. Uh, someone the other day told me, an 89-year-old woman told me that she has to fly to Ottawa to get a cortisone injection. Like this is completely crazy. So you can imagine the cost of that alone and her fear of having to fly to Toronto, Toronto, Ottawa, Ottawa, Toronto, and back again at 89 years old. So when you think of the overall cost provincially of this, um, there has to be an argument that can be made to say, you know, maybe we need to offer doctors four round trips each year to visit their family in Southern Ontario. Maybe they get a cottage for three weeks uh, out on Lake Superior. Maybe they get access to different things. Something that's not just money, but something that adds to their life. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Then we will move on to the final question that came in late last night. Um, if elected mayor, mayor, 
Will you agree that the Sioux is in a mental health crisis and declare a state of emergency to get provincial and or federal financial support? I'm going to start in the middle this time. Matthew Shoemaker. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I figured it was just a matter of time before you started <laughs> in the middle. Um, the, uh, I think it's ac absolutely something we have to look at doing. Um, I, I don't know what the consequences of declaring that are, but I do think that we are clearly in a mental health and addictions crisis, and that's why I believe that the municipality should put funding, municipal funding, into the establishment of a supervised consumption site. It is the biggest uh, issue that we're hearing at the doors, or at least that I'm hearing at the doors. Uh, I'm sure my friends would agree. Um, we have... Um, we don't have the same level of services that other northern community have, other northern communities have, like Sudbury and Timmins, and that's why I think we need to be a community that offers those services to the people in need in our community. Of course, we've got a residential withdrawal management facility that will open next year. Uh, that's good. We need to determine whether or not it will be sufficient for the capacity that our community is going to have, and if not, we need to work with. Uh, Ross Romano to have additional funding to have that expanded, but the city has a role to play, and that role is municipal dollars into a supervised consumption site. I'm committed to doing that as my top priority if I'm elected uh, this fall, and that's where I will focus my efforts with respect to uh, mental health and addictions, and that's uh, what the community can expect from me. Okay, thank you. Donna Hilsink. So we have a crisis, absolutely. We have residents um, of our city who are vulnerable and who are in crisis. And I already declared an emergency, if you will. Uh, earlier this year, I put forward a motion um, which uh, took from uh, the Ontario's big city mayors who asked the province for an urgent meeting for to, to talk together about creating a strategy around the resources needed and how we as a province are going to deal with these issues and give people the services and the treatment that they need. So the motion that I put forward said, hello, we're in Northern Ontario, we are suffering, our residents are suffering from some of the same challenges and we want to be at that table. Or we want our own table if the needs in, in Northern Ontario cities can't be treated the same way as in the larger cities. So I I have already done that. That was supported unanimously by my colleagues at City Council. Um, and uh, I have stated emphatically that on day one, it will be my first priority if I'm elected on Monday next week to tackle this issue to relentlessly tackle this issue to get for our city a, a combination between what we are able to provide along with the service providers in Sault Ste. Marie and the province needs to come to the table for all cities in Ontario with a strategy that's going to help us look after these people and give people the services they need. Okay. Thank you. Ozzy? Thanks for site <laughs> yes I, uh, I do support uh, um, calling on a state of emergency if I am elected uh, whether I do it on the next as soon as I'm sworn in I don't know um, like Councillor Shoemaker I, I do uh, support a supervised consumption site but on the other hand the people are also going to want to get help as well um, it can it can all be just us um, we in, in our family are dealing with this uh, at the moment with someone in our family and they just don't want to get help. We've tried. Everybody's tried. Mm -hmm. It's just you basically you basically you basically give up on them. But you don't want to. I've spoken to different people, and they've hit the nail on the head. And how how they are, and where they're going, where their next step is. Um, will this uh, new uh, treatment center on Second Line uh, help? Yes. But again, there's got to be somewhere else for these people to go. Um, the 30-day treatment, whatever it is, is. They, they go in there to get treatment, they can't, I, I think they gotta have somewhere else or it's gotta be a longer treatment. They can't, you can't just release them onto the streets with nowhere to go. Uh, they'll end up at some shelter, probably amongst people that have uh, drugs and whatnot. Uh, sorry, that are uh, dealing and everything else. So um, I, I will support it, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Jobin Kern. Um, I would absolutely support doing that on day one, as barring there was any serious negative implications of doing so. But I think it's important that we do such things um, uh, in order to keep focus on what our priorities are, to, 
to, to say out loud, this is an emergency, this is where we're going to focus our time, energy and resources, and we're not going to turn away until, uh, until that's done. Now, I, I think, you know, no one knows better than me about uh, how people are affected on this issue. I choose to work uh, with people who are suffering with uh, poor mental health and uh, the uh, struggling with addictions every day. So I know what a profound effect it has on those people's lives and their community. Um, but I think, you know, absolutely we're, we're, we do need to invest more in um, uh, treatment options for people. There is no such thing as a one-size-fits-all treatment because everyone's situation is different. So we need to look at uh, and, and call for more expansive um, treatment options. Just want to share, uh, I brought um, something along from the Canadian Mental Health and, uh, Association. And they have a testimonial for somebody who uh, engaged in a safer supply model. And, and uh, they, this is what they say. When they're engaged in safer supply, nobody has to steal anymore. No one has to do that. You can satisfy your needs and do what you need to without having to do anything illegal. I don't have to steal. I don't have to sell dope. So we really need to be uh, advocates for different, the different resources that our community needs in order to turn the tide on this. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, Robert Peace. Well, two years ago, I um, stood with a group named Chat, and we asked the city to declare a crisis, and there was silence. Last year, I stood in front of City Hall with a group with a protest, asked the mayor to call it a crisis. There was silence. I'm not sure about this motion, but there has never been declared a crisis uh, here that has not been a priority at City Hall that I've heard of, or that anybody that I know has heard of. I think I get very frustrated hearing over and over again that the solution to this major problem is a safe injection site that Mr. Shoemaker talks about. First of all, there's a huge debate if you've talked to anybody in this city who runs shelters, who runs programs, there's a huge debate on whether or even not that is the way to go. There is consensus among police and some people, but there is not consensus among the community that deal with mental health and addiction whatsoever. So I find you're completely tone deaf to that. And this idea of a GFL rally, that's the other thing that's gonna somehow uh, solve our problem here. It's just, to me, it's embarrassing. And the, the solutions to the, your solutions, at least to this crisis are so disconnected. I've heard from frontline workers uh, it's time to bring their voices to the table because uh, it's, it's, it's very obvious that upper management, which appears to be totally disconnected from reality, are not coordinating. We have huge silos in this city. There is tons of money being dumped into this issue, but it's not being channeled in the right ways. Um, there's a lot of frontline workers that are, you know, rather shocked at the millions that are being spent on buildings. We have a withdrawal management center that is not going to help one additional suite. This is a provincial facility that is a withdrawal management facility, not a treatment facility. So I think uh, what we've done in the past has not worked and doing more of the same is not going to do any better. Okay, thank you. So one last time, we'll open up the floor for rebuttal. Ozzy? Oh, it's, not, it's not really rebuttal, it's more comments, if that's, if that's all right. Um, it's, this is, uh, the problem isn't here, it's all over Canada, North America, if, we all, if uh, everyone's watching the news lately. Um, I ran into a gentleman about a month ago who moved, who moved back a few years ago from uh, Europe, and he said there's new vocabulary, new vocabulary that he hasn't heard in Europe before is an opioid crisis. Again, I think uh, we'll all be in agreement of this, but we have to lobby the provincial government. They're, they're content on giving hundreds of millions, if not billions of our dollars to the private sector for whatever reason, whether it be modernization or going green, when they could, prob when they could give a little bit of money towards the serious crisis that we're having in the province. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? No? Okay, so in this moment we will offer each candidate an opportunity to present final closing remarks. We will start with Donna Hilsinger. Thank you. I'm the only candidate of five that brings 40 years of experience in business, in leadership, 
and over 20 years and thousands and thousands of hours of volunteer community service. Well, why does that matter? It matters because I've learned how to get things done. I've learned how to work with others and move ideas forward. I've learned by volunteering my time in organizations and agencies across the spectrum from LGBTQ uh, advocacy to the Sioux Area Hospital to the Sioux Trails Advocacy um, uh, association that um, helped to build the John Rosewell Hub Trail, uh, the Sault Ste. Marie Economic Development Corporation, and I could go on and on. So it's given me um, a, an understanding of how to work with people, how to move things forward. I have a, hu a very wide network um, of colleagues um, out there, and I'm ready to do this job. I am ready to lead our council uh, um, and in, in this upcoming next term. We have some certainly some major challenges ahead. Um, that doesn't scare me. That makes me, uh, I, I know we have to gather and I know we have to think creatively and we have to think innovatively. And whether it comes to our major challenges around mental health, addictions, affordable housing and homelessness, to some of the opportunities that we have around um, doing more for climate change, um, uh, addressing our economic growth and and uh, cultural vitality. These are all things I'm excited to work on and, and uh, I truly hope that uh, you'll agree with me and I'll earn your vote um, on October 24th. Thank you, Donna. Ozzie Grandinetti. I wasn't expecting that, thank you. I thought you were gonna go online. <laughs> well, I could sit here and toot my own horn and tell you what I've done in the past 30 years or tell you what I could do in the future, but I won't. Or sit, thank you very much. Our city has a long, rich, proud history with huge potential for the future. I want to be your full-time mayor so we could get back to the basics, get focused on working together, collectively solving the pressing issues in our city as well as those we encounter over the next four years. I will take the role of being the mayor very seriously and will work with all members of council to ensure that we are all responsive to the needs of our constituents. We need to focus on finding efficiencies and improve services with our municipality. We also need to ensure that our agencies that receive city funding and who provide provincial programs and services are held accountable to the people of Sault Ste. Marie. Like most of you, I'm a hardworking individual, pays his fair share of taxes, and knows that we, as a community, deserve better and that we have the resources and willingness to see it happen. As mentioned many times throughout this campaign, that a vote for me is a vote for you, the people of Sault Ste. Marie, and not a vote for the old boys club that control every aspect on how your tax dollar is spent. I know I'm confident that as a full-time mayor, I can provide the necessary leadership to get City Hall open to do business in a welcoming way and get focused to get back to the basics. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Peace. Thank you. Well, I believe that we need someone with a strong and competent voice. I have that. We need someone ready to make changes. I'm ready. And we need someone who has a heart and empathy. And I have that. Doing the same things over and over or throwing dollars at failed ideas of the past won't work. Being mayor part-time won't cut it anymore either. I had my own business for 23 years and I've been working with a local business for the past few and I know the challenges we face. We need a healthy society for anything to work right. Less red tape for business, but not a free ride for a taxpayer's expense. Uh, we must grow the tax base. People want better services and lower taxes. That won't happen unless we grow our tax base. And there's competition for those people, so we have to rise to that, that uh, opportunity. So I bring to the people of Sault Ste. Marie a full-time commitment to this job. I don't own another business. I won't be working three jobs, and I won't have the conflicts that Mr. Shoemaker will continue to bring to the job. Let's stop it now. We have new faces at the table and running for council. The consensus has been at the doors that people are fed up with the closed-door policies, the lack of transparency, and the continued passing of work to friends and businesses associated with politicians. To effect change and have a truly democratic government, you are going to have to vote. And you are going to have to vote 
for someone you believe not only wants to change things, but has the courage to make those changes. Thank you. And please, I ask for your vote on October 24th. Thank you. Tobin Kern. I decided to run for the mayor's office out of a sense of obligation and concern. Um, for me, the community is, is not so much about what the community has, it's more a community is made out of people. And what I see, unfortunately, is uh, there's too many people in this community who don't have what they need, too many people who aren't doing well, and too little be do, being done for future generations. On climate change, uh, we see uh, an impending crisis. All the authorities confirm that this is the case and we need to prepare ourselves and do as much as we can to address this. And that includes what we can do in Sault Ste. Marie. The good news is what we can do uh, won't cost a lot necessarily, likely won't cost a lot, and uh, will improve the, our quality of life. So we need to make some moves on climate change. Um, I choose to work in social services. Um, I meet with people who are struggling every day and definitely there are more people in our community struggling with mental health and the addictions crisis. So rather than make these um, secondary or tertiary uh, focus, they would be my main focus. I see that there are three crises that face our city, one being climate change, one being affordable housing uh, and, and homelessness, and the third being the addictions epidemic. Um, as mayor, you can count on me to do as much as possible to keep the, my eye on the ball and make sure that the top priorities remain the top priorities until we turn the tide on the things that are most pressing in our community. What everyone needs to do is um, get out and vote on October 24th, and I hope I can have your vote. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tobin. And Matthew Shoemaker, final remarks. Thank you, Heidi, and thank you to Sue Online for hosting us today and giving the opportunity, giving us the opportunity to speak to the community about the upcoming election. As you've heard today and throughout the campaign, I have a platform, a plan for progress. It is available in full on my website, matthewshoemaker.ca, and I encourage you to take a look at it. While other candidates in the race have tried to pitch the idea that having a platform is not important, I think that being prepared transparent and having a plan shows the community that I'm serious about the job that needs done in the next term. A plan for progress discusses the critical issues that our city is facing. In it you will find real ideas to drive real change, ideas that are specific, realistic and achievable in our community. It has been developed over the course of months of community consultations with stakeholders and residents. If I'm elected, I will work with Council to start the ball rolling on these initiatives over the course of the term. You will be able to judge my success or failures in four years' time based on whether or not I've been able to convince the majority of Council of the merits of the plan. A plan for progress is about the need for a supervised consumption site in our community to help battle the addictions crisis that's gripping our city and hitting our downtown especially hard. It speaks of my desire to see more people downtown and to help them feel safe by having a permanent police presence in the downtown core. That I'll return to the days of lobbying the province and federal government aggressively, like the late John Roswell did. On the environment, I detail out my plans to double municipal tree planting, and I want to do this all in a way that won't skyrocket your taxes. We need growth, and we need investment in our community, but we also need to do that in a managed and prudent way. I've shown my work, I've got the plan, and I'm on your side. And on October 24th, I hope to earn your vote for mayor. Well, thank you very much. On behalf of the community and the team here at Sioux Online on TV, we would like to thank you all for making time in your schedules to do this event with us here today. On behalf of Sioux Online and on TV, I'm Heidi Ivany. Thank you so much for watching. Go out and vote on Monday.